All right. Uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Emerging Wisely 2021 for Businesses. Today we are joined by Dr. Cami Candola, Chief Public Health Officer for the NWT. Uh, without further ado, we'll hand it over to you, Dr. Candola. Good afternoon, everyone. I am pleased to present the new updated Emerging Wisely 2021 plan today and answer questions from representatives from the Yellowknife and NWT Chambers of Commerce and the Chambers of Mind. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. As you know, the new Emerging Wisely plan was released publicly one week ago. Merging Wisely 2021 step by step together is more than a plan focused on easing and ultimately removing restrictions related to public health orders. It is also about taking steps towards learning to live with COVID-19 in the Northwest Territories for years to come. We have effective vaccines and enough of them. We have a population that understands the basic things, physical distancing, washing hands frequently that can keep them safe. COVID-19 will likely be with us for a long time though. We will have to learn to live with it. That's why Emerging Wisely 2021 has a strong focus on personal risk mitigation and guidance. People are going to continue to get COVID-19. We want our residents to consider that risk when they look to take part in activities and how they can mitigate this risk. Next slide, please. So today we'll review these aspects of Emerging Wisely 2021 step-by-step step together. The overview will um, be on the background, guiding principles of policy approach, risk management and guidance, relaxing measures, planning for future waves, key variables and risk factors, living with COVID-19 and next steps. Next slide, please. While we continue to roll out the vaccine and are easing restrictions further, the health and safety of NWT residents remains the GNWT's number one priority. Under the new Emerging Wisely Plan, we will still promote and protect public health while outlining the step-by-step -step approach to further easing of restrictions. Since Emerging Wisely was released in April 2020, a lot has changed. The pandemic has entered subsequent waves variants of concern have emerged and effective vaccines are now available. We also have a better understanding of how COVID-19 spreads and how we can manage the risk to the population through public health measures and individual precautions. We also need to recognize that as restrictions are eased and ultimately removed, the public will take on more responsibility for protecting themselves and others. Better understanding of your risk means NWT residents can make informed choices and actions to keep you, your family, friends, and community safe. Merging Wisely 2021 provides guidance on what risk might be, what to do to consider assessing risk. And I'll talk about this in more detail later on in the presentation. Next slide, please. The original Merging Wisely used a phased approach in guidance through the pandemic. We are moving away from phases and towards more risk mitigation and guidance based on vaccination coverage and population risk, risk of importation, and our health system's capacity to respond. As we learn more about the virus, this approach provided some challenges to our pandemic response. And it has set expectations for the public that restrictions would all end once we get effective vaccines. We've learned from that experience and developed a plan that we think is right for this stage of the pandemic. Next slide, please. There's no single fixed target that signals when we can relax measures. There are conditions informed by the data that shows the overall risk and restrictions will be eased based upon this risk level. As NWT vaccination coverage increases, Emerging Wisely 2021 has started by easing restrictions on outdoor activities first, which are the lowest risk. And we will be moving towards easing restrictions on high risk activities as conditions allow in a measured 
step-by-step -step way. As the pandemic continues to unfold, we can ease restrictions as conditions and data allow, enhance restrictions as required, and target restrictions when necessary. The Merging Wisely 2021 is designed with the goal of being quickly and easily understood by as many people as possible, especially those who may not read the full text. Those still contain enough information for people to make informed decisions. Next slide, please. The visual on this slide was taken from the NWT COVID dashboard. There is a wealth of information on this dashboard. This shows vaccination coverage in the NWT represents that coverage with four colors, red, orange, yellow, and green. Merging Wisely 2021 sets out four categories that describes overall, overall risk. Red is the highest risk, lowest vaccination levels. Orange is high risk, low vaccination levels. Yellow is moderate risk, moderate vaccination levels. And green is low risk, high vaccination levels. Vaccination coverage varies between regions and communities in the territory. As a result, some places are more vulnerable to an outbreak than others. Community level vaccination coverage is now publicly available along with regional coverage. In that way, people can understand their overall level of risk. But decision to ease restrictions will be based on the overall vaccine coverage of those 18 and over in the Northwest Territory. Next slide, please. Overall risk to the Northwest Territories will be carefully assessed before easing public health measures. When Emerging Wisely 2021 was released last Wednesday, the NWT relaxed overall public health restrictions on outdoor gatherings. Garage sales, farmer markets, parades of up to 200 people can take place with no restrictions. We can gather in large numbers outdoors again. As vaccine coverage remains uneven, it is wise to maintain physical distancing and appropriate masking. And remember routine public health measures, such as proper hand washing, healthy respiratory practices, and staying home when you are sick. Some gatherings are still considered high risk, like funerals or celebrations of life, or large events with over 200 people. These activities still need approval from the Office of the Chief Public Health Officer. Our office will work with organizers to set measures that will help reduce the risk to everyone attending these events. So you may ask why are outdoor gatherings less risky than indoor ones? We know that COVID-19 is spread by respiratory droplets. It is spread through the air and is passed from person to person. It can also be caught by touching surfaces that someone who has COVID has touched with respiratory droplets on their hands, for example. But surface contamination is not as contagious as first beer. So when outdoors, respiratory droplets have much more room to escape faster, making COVID-19 more difficult to transmit in outdoor settings. Next slide, please. As I mentioned in the previous slide, by relaxing the measures on outdoor gatherings, people in Northwest Territories this summer will be able to attend parades, gather on patios, hold outdoor garage sales, have outdoor youth day camps and overnight summer camps. There will be no limits on numbers for outdoor sports, but players should follow COVID-19 guidelines from the national and provincial sports organizations. Again, because of the risk associated with them, outdoor funerals and celebrations of life will still require an exemption from the CPHO. An event over 200 people will require an exemption. This is intended to capture really large events like Folk on the Rocks or Jamborees. These will go ahead with distancing and other mitigation measures in place. Organizations have always been free to request an exemption. And if approved, they need to follow the conditions other exemption to mitigate risk and maintain compliance with public health orders. Next slide, please. As we increase vaccine coverage, we can relax indoor gathering restrictions. One sixty-six to seventy-five percent of the NWT population, eighteen and over, is fully vaccinated, or 
75% have had their first dose. We will make these changes. The earliest estimate this would happen would be early July after the school year ends. As you just saw in the early slide, we're now at 63% of the population, 18 and over, that are fully vaccinated. So we are very close to meeting this metric. And now working to get those who have already received the vaccine to get their second dose. When we relax these restrictions, we will be able to gather indoors again with some limits on highest risk activities. All indoor public spaces can return to near pre-pandemic capacities. That means we can gather in restaurants, stores, places of worship, offices, and other businesses as we did before the pandemic. We can go over to people's houses that are not in a bubble, host friends and family in our home. We can look forward to events like family reunions, workplace get-togethers and parties. The public should still understand and consider the risk of getting COVID-19 before taking part in outdoor activities and the ways to mitigate that risk. Up to 200 people will be able to gather indoors in one space. This, limits, this limit allows the healthcare system to better respond should there be COVID-19 cases linked to an indoor gathering. Higher risk activities will require an improved exposure plan, such as live indoor singing, wind instrument performance, indoor dancing, hand games, funerals, and indoor winter sports. Groups with existing approved plans will not need to reapply unless they would like to change how they are gathering. Next slide, please. Again, to repeat, there will still be some indirect activities where restrictions will remain in place. And these higher risk activities will include indoor live singing, wind instrument performance, indoor dancing, hand games, funerals, and indoor winter sports. These will all require approved plan, exposure plan. However, just another reminder, groups with existing approved plans will not need to reapply unless they would like to change how they're gathering. Next slide, please. Requiring people who have returned to the Northwest Territories from out of territory travel has been one of the pillars of our pandemic response. And it has helped keep COVID-19 cases down and our residents and communities safe. We also know self-isolating is challenging for some individuals, and it's one of those public health measures residents are eagerly looking forward to have relaxed. In Emerging Wisely 2021, once Canadian vaccine first dose coverage reaches the 66 to 75 percent threshold for 18 and older, and once the COVID average daily case counts are below 1,000 per day over a seven-day average, we will change travel restrictions and self-isolation requirements. So the early estimate for this would occur in early summer, but could be earlier. And at that time, the recommendation that NWT residents avoid non-essential travel will be rescinded. And so we have met the first condition. At this point, I believe close to 75% of Canadians 12 and older have received the first dose, which represents 65% of the general population. And for two consecutive days, we have been below the 1,000 case count in Canada. So we are getting really close to reaching a moving seven-day average of less than 1,000 daily cases in Canada. What does that mean? It means fully vaccinated residents and the households they return to will no longer have to self-isolate when that travel returns from the NWT. They will have to monitor for symptoms only. Partially vaccinated residents and that Households they return to will have to self isolate for eight days and can end that with self monitoring on a day eight negative test. Unvaccinated residents and the households will have to self isolate for 10 days, but they can end that on a day 10 test and, and complete the rest with self monitoring. Next slide, please. So we have restricted leisure travel into the Northwest Territory since the start of the pandemic. When NWT two dose vaccination coverage reaches 75% of the eligible population, which we define as adults 18 and older. And when Canada's two dose vaccination coverage reaches 66 to 75% of the adult population and the national COVID-19 daily average case count still remains under a thousand, the risk 
restrictions on leisure travel into the Northwest Territories will be lifted. The earliest we would estimate this would occur would be late summer, early fall. At this point, anyone will be able to travel to the Northwest Territories, regardless of where they came from. All travels we need to follow the, the same self-isolation requirements. So fully vaccinated travels won't have to self-isolate. Um, but if these travels are going into vulnerable congregate settings, they um, will have to take a day one and day 14 COVID test. Partially vaccinated travels will have to self-isolate for eight days and can end that with a negative day eight test. And unvaccinated travelers will have to self-isolate for 10 days and end that with a negative day test. All travelers to small communities will need a day 14 exit test when they finish the self-monitoring. Next slide, please. So this is a slide we have all been waiting for, the point where we end all restrictions. And this will occur when the NWT vaccination coverage for the 12 and over group has reached 75%. And when the vaccination coverage for our general population first dose has reached between 66 to 75%. And that we still maintain a daily national average of below 1,000 cases. So the earliest we estimate that will meet this threshold and lift all restrictions is mid to late fall. No restrictions means no self-isolation requirements for anyone, no travel restrictions, and no limits on capacity and activities indoors or outdoors. It also means the structures we put in place to respond to the pandemic will no longer be here. COVID-19 compliance and enforcement, protect and the DT, border monitoring, enhanced testing, and enhanced contact tracing will all stand down. The virus will still be with us. The pandemic not, may not even be declared over by then, but we will adjust to a new normal, which is living with COVID-19. It is important to note that the Public Health Agency of Canada anticipates that we will see an increase in cases across Canada in the fall, based on more Canadians gathering indoors and growing evidence that COVID-19 may be seasonal in nature. We will track that, be keenly interested if this occurs with our current vaccine coverage rate. So you may wonder why op office is using under a thousand cases per day uh, over weekly average. Nationally is one of the indicators are looking at easing restrictions. We feel this number lessens the risk of importation of COVID-19 to our territory. And this allows us to reduce self-isolation requirements for partially and unvaccinated individuals in addition to our fully vaccinated individuals. And we have spent the last few months hearing about daily average case counts that went as high as 9,000 per day. It makes it easy to forget that last summer, the daily average case count was well under 1,000 per day. And that was before vaccines were available. So as we've noted in the last two days, this number is actually achievable. Next slide. As I mentioned in the previous slide, COVID-19 isn't going anywhere. Variants of concern will continue to emerge and current vaccines may be less effective or ineffective against key variants. Because variants of concern spread more quickly and cause more severe illness than the original COVID-19 strain, we have to monitor them closely. Booster doses may be required to protect NWT residents from these variants. And should a new variant or public health risk occur, we will release an update to this plan to reflect the current risk at that time. And we are waiting for further guidance from the federal government on when it will open our borders to international and U.S. travel. It's, it is anticipated that over 75% of Canadians need to be vaccinated before the government of Canada would consider reopening the U.S. border and lifting the international restrictions on non-essential travel. And I have mentioned that Emerging Wisely 2021 has a strong fo focus on personal choice and risk management. Individuals' decisions to get vaccinated if they are eligible, following public health orders, and health respiratory practice have a big influence on whether we experience another outbreak or community spread. Northerners have done a great job of stopping the spread of COVID-19 so far, and we want them to keep up with their great work when we start lifting restrictions. That is why this plan gives them some tools to understand COVID-19 risks and what they can do to mitigate them. Next slide, please. As public health measures continue to relax across the NWT and Canada, and we learn to live with COVID-19, individuals will still will need to make personal risk assessments 
and choose the best options to protect themselves. Emerging Wisely 2021 includes links to self-assessment tools, guidance on how to respond to your practices, and information on the process for contact tracing and what to do for your contact. It provides simple ways for individuals to learn to mitigate risk individually and collectively, such as considering the vaccine rate in your community when you take part in activities, considering where a gathering is being held, what is the size of the gathering, who is attending the gathering, what is the level of susceptibility to that population? Is the activity indoors or outdoors? If it's indoors, will distancing be possible? And how long will the activity last? By having more northerners consider these factors in the day-to-day -day life, we can all continue to do our part to defeat COVID-19. Next slide, please. We want NWT residents to understand Emerging Wisely 2021. When there is no understanding, there is no communication. This final slide features a poster that gives a simple and clearly understandable look at what restrictions will be relaxed under Emerging Wisely 2021, when they will be relaxed, and what factors will allow them to be relaxed. Even if our residents don't read all or any of the report, they can look at this simple poster and understand what is happening. We do plan to distribute this throughout the NWT, and we encourage the chambers to do the same. Please share it among the members, share it on your social media channels, and then share it in your communities. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And I and our participants around the table will be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Candola. Um, so at this point, we have some questions uh, that have been submitted by our membership and to anyone else on the call with us. If you have any questions, uh, please type them in the chat box and time permitting, uh, we'll get to those after. So the first question that I have for you is Emerging Wisely 2021 states that outdoor activities involving less than 200 people can go ahead with minimal restrictions. What safety protocols like hand sanitizing and physical distancing and masks and documentation, for example, exposure control plans, are required to proceed with large outdoor events? And do businesses need to notify the office of the chief public health officer? Okay, so thank you. And thank you for the questions. So most of these questions I typically route for our environmental health office. I do have the pleasure of having the Chief Environmental Health Officer of Keenan Workman here. So we're going to um, work for the questions. He'll respond to the questions. And if there's something in addition, he can reflect them over to me. I'm just going to protect my voice, which is going to dry up. <laughs> so thanks for your question, for sure. Um, so businesses would only need to notify or connect with the Office of the Chief Public Health Officer if they intend to host an activity with more than 200 people. With less than 200 people, you would need to do appropriate risk assessments and choices, um, make the risk decisions based on what you know about your community and your situation and the facility and the situation that your um, event presents. High risk activities for funerals and celebrations of life still require an approval from us. We have some recommendations related to those. Um, businesses wanting to host outdoor gatherings of greater than 200 people, you would still need to follow WSCC requirements, so the things from the Worker Safety and Compensation Commission relating to your volunteers or your employees to make sure that you've got your protections and documentation in place to cover that. Um, and then you would apply and submit a, a request to vary. Many of the businesses that um, I deal with have already, um, that our chamber members have already done this. Restaurants have applied for exceeding, um, adding extra additional persons in the restaurant facility or their space. It's the same type of application. You're doing a risk assessment based on what you're, you're providing us some information and guidance on what your um, control plan contains and how you're going to try and mitigate the risk for the additional persons that you're putting into your space. Um, you can apply for the exemption for it. One of the things that we want to make clear is um, if you own an overarching facility, say you're a hotel and you have a large room, you're going to get a pre-existing, this room can hold this many people for this activity. So you're going to have a meeting in this room, you're going to have 400 people in the meeting room, 
Not that that's likely. I don't think we have a room with 400 people in it, but you're going to get your room pre-approved for that. So then any group that comes to you to use your facility would utilize that approval and that plan. So if you're the hotel and you have 150, a room set up to do 150 people at a sit down meeting or a banquet that's going to be this and this particular activity, you as a facility get the approval for it. And then whoever's renting your facility or making use of it can use those approvals and wouldn't need to get a separate approval. It would be an overarching facility approval. Um, I think I covered most of it. The events, masking and social distancing, protective barriers and limits depend on what activity is going on in the events you're having. If you're having live music, there are some specific requirements we can help you work through around distancing, amount of time, increasing ventilation, mask use, or potentially some tracking and tracing if it's necessary. We would help through that process and try to explain it and make sure that it's clear and facilitate you um, determining your risks and figuring out the best way forward. Great, thank you. So to confirm, if businesses are hosting events with under 200 people, they would not need to apply for any exemptions or submit any of those documentations uh, to protect NWT. As long as they're in compliance with WSCC requirements, they can proceed. So WSCC requirements, and there is a list of live singing, woodwind instrument performances, indoor dancing, funerals, and hand games. And I think the last one is winter sports. Those are indoors. Indoor winter sports. Those are the sort of those are the peak list that has to have approvals. Everything else less than 200 people, you don't have to submit or request approval from us. Great, thank you. And I think that um, is a great segue into the next question, um, which is that uh, in emerging wisely, it does say that um, all indoor public spaces can return to near pre-pandemic capacities. Are you able to provide some clarification um, in what circumstances would a business not be able to return to pre-pandemic capacity? Are we just talking about those high risk activities that were identified or are there other considerations? It's the high risk activities that we're, told, that we're classifying that would, would put the limits or would change the capacity requirements in your facilities. So live singing, woodwind instrument performance, indoor dancing, Funerals or hand games and uh, indoor winter sports. Great, thank you. And for less than 200 people. Yeah. And, and anything over 200 people, you need to. That's it. Anything over 200 people, indoor and outdoor, uh, can, would need to go through our office. Great, thank you. Um, so you kind of touched on this a little bit, but many businesses already have exemptions in place. Um, that allow them to accommodate larger groups. Um, so you mentioned that those exemptions will still be valid. And now um, I'm assuming that businesses will be able to apply to further increase their capacity and that it will be venue based. So they won't need to continuously apply for each event that they host. Right, it would be venue specific. So it relates to the physical structures of the venue and the activity going on. So if you're hosting a, a Let's put an example and say it's a bar and they're hosting a band night where there's a single singer and a performer. We would provide guidance and recommendations and requirements for how that can be done safely or as safely as possible. It relates to the facility. So they host a band night if they do it three nights a week, five nights a week, as long as it's the same frame of reference and the same performer load, same number of performers, same number of same characteristics. There would be no need to apply for each performer to apply. The example I'd use would be the Black Knight. The Black Knight used to host a jam night. If they get an approval and go through the process to have an approval for a band evening that has three performers in this situation, that's how they would do it. Um, and they would come across um, with an approval that would be standard for that organization and that location. Great, thank you. And are there resources available for those businesses who will be pursuing um, activities that have some of those um, high risk activities that you identify? Are there like standardized forms that can help businesses get started with the process? 
So the request to vary form and the risk assessment document that already exists on the COVID website that have been in place since some time ago exists and provides some guidance about the risk assessment. But the WSCC Exposure Control Plan helps you figure out the risks and work through it yourself relating to your specific facility and your employees. And that helps inform the risk assessment for the department, for us, for the Office of Chief Public Health Officer. So that information does exist. And certainly, if folks have questions in regards to this, they can reach out to the environmental underscore health email address, which is the generic email for Environmental Health Office. They can reach out to that email address. Um, we would ask that you've looked at or done at least the initial legwork and information in regards to the WSCC document because it helps delineate where the risks are and figure out the specifics of your facility. But that information, we'll be providing a written answer as well that will have those links. Yeah. And I think it's important just to add that we have these plans put in place because we will be, um, when we do the indoor gathering relaxation, we'll be relaxing at uh, vaccination levels um, that were similar to the ones in the Callaway and Whitehorse. Uh, but you still can get um, spread through the um, bars and restaurants if you have a high level of unvaccinated people in that situation. So these type of measures are a good way of trying to mitigate as much as possible outbreaks and spread. But we're also cognizant, even if we, Yellowknife at right now is a 76% uh, first dose vaccinated, 68% full dose. These are good rates, but we just, we also realize that um, when we look at our, our partners, White Horse and the Callaway, even with their high rates, they, they still had outbreaks happen with karaoke events and crowded bars. The other thing I just was reminded of, thanks, Sonia, was the um, when the emerging lines and the indoors materials come out and when the, the, relief, the relaxing phase for indoors does come out, there will be some communications products as well that will come out that hopefully will inform this as well and help guide where these things are. And we are doing some improvements, consistent improvements to our website to try to make it easier to find things and make them all that much better to find. Um, bear with us while it changes. Great, thank you. And, and certainly um, we will share that information with Yellowknife businesses and our membership um, and also just to remind everyone on this webinar now that um, the Yellowknife Chamber of Commerce with support from the Department of Industry, Tourism and, and Investment have actually created an exposure control plan template. Um, I'll put a, a link in, in the chat here shortly. Um, also, we just have a question seeking clarification that once they go back to pre-pandemic capacities indoors, that they do uh, not need an exemption, that they're able to just uh, go back to their full capacity with the exception, um, as long as they're not having any of those high risk activities. Can you confirm that? That's correct. That is correct. They will not need to do that unless they have one of the high risk activities associated. Great, thank you. Um, one of the other questions um, is, is quite specific, but um, we're wondering when buffet style catering will be permitted. Okay. So when the indoor relaxation comes, buffet-style catering will be allowed. Um, we'll have some recommendations for um, how to mitigate for crowding in the buffets. Um, one of the reasons that buffets were prohibited were early on in the pandemic, the risk in the conversation around transmission between I, I'm handling the spoon and Cami, Dr. Kindle is handling the spoon and other people are handling it. That's less of a risk, but the current risk is the mixing and mingling between household groups, et cetera. We're encouraging you to still try and maintain some distance and some separations as a recommendation, not a requirement. So when the indoor order comes into play, buffets can return, but we encourage you to do it in a way that there isn't a huge crush and lineup at your buffet stations. Recommendation is that they get folks to use hand sanitizer before coming to the buffet to serve the plates and do what you can to mitigate crowding and prevent mingling and intermingling as much as possible for a little bit longer. But we're not putting a requirement in that says once the indoor measures are in place, 
buffets can return, but with a little bit of effort to try to, to do what you can to space people out of it. It's not going to be an order. Can businesses require their staff to be vaccinated? And can businesses require customers to show proof of vaccination? For example, when booking a tourism experience or booking a stay at uh, something like an Airbnb. Thank you. Thank you. So for question four and five, uh, our deputy minister, uh, Bruce Cooper will respond. Thanks very much. Um, so the question regarding uh, requiring staff to be vaccinated is a very uh, significant uh, ethical and legal issue that we ourselves in the healthcare system in Canada are have been wrestling with for some time over all matters of vaccine. And so what I'm going to say, uh, the answer to this one is, um, you know, businesses can consider whether vaccination of staff would be part of a uh, an exposure control plan developed under the safety legislation and, and OHS regulations. That can be considered as part of that. But the fact is that um, uh, this is truly a legal question that is beyond the scope of the Safety Act, and it's not something that generally would be given as health advice. Uh, it requires the, each employer to consider this in the, in the context of uh, ex the exposure control as well as other parts of law, such as labor standards legislation and charter rights and these sorts of things. So it's a very complex question. I apologize that it's not a black and white answer. I think that's why I got to answer it. <laughs> the, uh, next, Thank you. the next uh, question I know you have is, can businesses require customers to show proof of vaccination? And so uh, it's our sense that businesses can request proof of vaccination from uh, customers, and uh, we certainly um, are working as a territory to make that information more available to residents of the Northwest Territories, um, and um, and have uh, have done so through the Health Authority. And we're working with our partners in uh, the federal government and other provinces and territories to to uh, come up with an approach uh, that will be accepted um, beyond our borders. Uh, when we get to a place when uh, the borders uh, for international travel do open up. Thanks for that. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is that um, we anticipate that the criteria re required to eliminate self-isolation for fully vaccinated individuals will be met in the coming days, but there are many circumstances of fully vaccinated adults with unvaccinated children who would still be required to self-isolate for 10 days. Uh, many people think this is unfair. Um, we do understand that Pfizer may be available for children under 11 by September, but in the meantime, can you speak about the decision to require fully vaccinated adults with an unvaccinated child to self-isolate for 10 days? And will you be considering exemptions in the future, uh, similar to what's being done in Manitoba and uh, potentially the Yukon? So requiring children in the fall and their families to self-isolate was not meant to be a punishment. The rationale behind this requirement is because children carrying the virus can easily spread it to others in their family and others in close contact, classmates, teammates, at the pool, at summer camp, um, at the movie theater. Um, and they're, they're often not as easy, able to follow public health measures such as covering sneezes, washing hands, and maintaining social distancing. And so we did see during the NJ school outbreak how quickly the virus was able to spread through close contact and through school and with, this was a highly transmissible variant of concern. And so this will continue to be an issue um, until such a time we're able to increase our vaccination rates for this population and also provide immunization to the younger population. We do want to keep our schools and communities safe and prevent another outbreak. And so what you've seen um, in Yukon is they have an explosion of cases um, involving unvaccinated um, individuals in the school system. So it will be the, the involved elementary schools, high schools, and um, bars. And in Nunavut, they, they're experiencing um, cases in the middle school. One of the things that people have to understand is um, it, it is tough, but in NWT, we're the only um, uh, 
jurisdiction that has um, isolation requirements that's actually reducing isolation period for unvaccinated periods from 14 to 10 days and for partially vaccinated to um, day eight for the test. So what you have to do is flip the question around. Um, people who are unvaccinated can spread the virus. So if you are a parent and has a child in daycare or summer camp and if that child has complex chronic conditions and you've made the decision not to travel out that you're trying to keep your child as protected as possible because they're not eligible to get vaccinated, can I theoretically take a child that has traveled out that where um, we are seeing that the only cases of COVID we get in them is imported and then tell that mother the infant that this child is free to go to the daycare, to go to summer camp, to be not vaccinated um, and be able to spread it to someone who's made the decision not to travel. Because I'm looking at it from the COVID transmission point of view, and we've seen scenario after scenario where outbreaks are now occurring in, in unvaccinated children. In northern um, Ontario, for instance, there's a large outbreak in, um, on the reserve in unvaccinated children. In Yukon, there's um, starting to see cases in the elementary school population. We've already had our NJ outbreak and Nunavut as well. So it's not about a, a matter of what's fair or not. The, the COVID virus is an unfair virus. We didn't ask for it to occur. It is here. It's more about how to prevent introduction of COVID into NWT into those crowded restaurants that you want, that you're able to now have into the bars, into summer camps. And the best way is reduce it is to have a strong measure of isolation for people coming in. Great, thank you. And just being mindful of the time, I think we'll just do one more question. Um, can you speak about how rapid testing is currently being used within the NWT, uh, particularly for essential workers? Um, and then also, are you considering using rapid testing to eliminate self-isolation requirements for partially vaccinated and, again, those fully vaccinated adults with unvaccinated children? So what we know is that um, the, if you're exposed to a COVID virus, it takes 14 days. It takes about 14 days for that virus to incubate. Um, getting a test is not going to change how COVID virus incubates. It's, I'm sorry. If that was the golden uh, question, we would all just do a rapid test on day one. Um, COVID virus has a full 14 days to incubate. What we do know is most of, of the uh, virus is people become symptomatic in the first five to seven days. Unfortunately, when you look at the younger population and 40% of our cases, they have no symptoms. So we don't know when they um, are, have the virus or when they can pass it on. So um, a test is not going to change that. But what we do is we look at vaccination status and we look at probability and risk. So we take on a risk that a virus may occur up to day 14, and we look at the vaccination status. So if you're fully immunized, um, the, the risk is reduced by 90% um, for um, getting infected and passing it on. So that's a, a, a risk that we will say, okay, we will um, take that 10% risk, and if you're fully immunized, you may not have to isolate. If you're unvaccinated, um, to get that 90% re risk reduction, you actually have to isolate for 10 days. Um, at 10 days, if you're unvaccinated and you have a very low importation, you have a, um, your risk is reduced by 90%. But that's because we wait out the incubation period. And if you're partially vaccinated, you're somewhere in the middle. Fortunately, with um, the um, Delta variant, what we do know is even a one dose doesn't protect you. So we are... Um, moving that um, day eight test uh, so you can vaccinate for, you can isolate for um, up until you get day eight test negative, but um, that's also taking the rest of the second week. Um, if you were exposed to a Delta variant, you would have only 33% chance of it being effective. So we take risks all the time, but to um, replace um, rapid testing when the risk is high is again. Um, um, having that risk of an introduction at the very time when you're going to have the um, us going back to near normal pandemic period.
pre-pandemic capacities in our restaurants, in our outdoor activities. So it would be, um, we would be, again, end up in a scenario like what we're seeing in Yukon. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Condola, and uh, to everyone on your team. And uh, a big thank you to everyone for joining us uh, for today's on-demand webinar. Um, in closing, I'd also like to uh, just remind all of our attendees of the Yellowknife Chamber's Crush COVID Yellowknife Initiative. Um, we are running a vaccination incentive program where adults who receive the second shot of, the, of a COVID-19 vaccine can visit participating businesses to uh, redeem one of the incentives. And we also have our Crush COVID Yellowknife draw. And again, information on, uh, on all of those programs are available on our website. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining today. And if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to send them to me and, uh, and we will get uh, answers for you. Thanks again.